back, everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. And I am super excited to welcome back to our show again. We have Debbie Semeca Diaz. She is one of the trainers in the New York area. She is the founder of the Center for EFT in New Jersey. I hope I said that right. <laughs> um, but there's a, there's a center for EFT New Jersey and Debbie is the founder and she's one of our amazing trainers and um, she does a lot of great work around affairs and she has some online stuff, which I'll have her share later on. And she's also been on our show before um, contributing to some really, really great topics. So we're excited Debbie to have you back again today. And um, we are going to be visiting the basics. So this is a trip back to the basics in EFT. And, you know, Debbie, I'm sure in your growth as an EFT therapist and becoming a trainer, you know, knowing the basics is really important. Yet in some levels, the basics are so simple, but it's something that I feel like even as we grow, we can kind of keep losing and kind of plateau in again. What do you kind of see for therapists as they're kind of learning EFT? Um, well, I agree with exactly what you just said as far as <clears throat> back to the basics. The basics are really simple. In fact, our model of EFT is super simple. And I think what I've noticed, because I've been a trainer for like, I think, 12 years now, is I, I noticed that sort of the trainings and um, the way we're teaching EFT gets more complex over the past 12 years. And then I'm like, wait a minute, we need to simplify this down and go back to the basics. What are we doing in our sessions? And the thing that I'm noticing the most that's happening with therapists is they're so busy um, tracking cycles and assembling emotion that they're forgetting to look in the room and be experiential. That's the biggest thing that I'm noticing. People aren't saying what they see right in front of them because they're tracking words. And I'm really finding that once you start tracking words, you're missing when people are looking down or the slightest shift of the body. And those are the things that we really as EFT therapists need to be kind of like noticing that and saying those stop mid-sentence and say what you see in the room, because that's more important than tracking the content story. So, Right. And, and part of the cycle isn't really about the content. It's about the process of emotion. And I like what you're saying is we can get so caught up kind of in the business of the cycle that we forget to see the person in front of us and the emotional cues that they're giving us that gives us a lot of information about their emotional experience. And then we kind of miss stepping into that because EFT is present process. Yes, we do talk about the past, but as it relates to the here and now, mm -hmm. and it's important to be able to stay in the here and now. And I, I have found that a lot with supervisees is staying in the present process is super hard and they kind of miss it. It's like, and it is hard. I get it. Like EFT is simple, but complex at the same time because there's a lot of things coming at you at once and so being able to sort through what's in front of you and even I think the biggest hurdle or the first hurdle is being able to understand what's right in front of you and to be able to conceptualize what's unfolding right in front of you. Right. Well, and I think you're you're talking about the things that the couple's throwing at you, right? There's so much that information that they're giving you. And then I also feel as the EFT therapist, we're trying really hard to hold so many balls of like on the model, if you will. There's all the interventions, there's the different steps, the stages, the moves of the tango. And while we're trying to do all that, we're up here. Yes. And the couple is like sending all this stuff to us, and it's a lot of content stuff. Um, that it makes it really hard exactly to just see what's sitting in front of you and say, wow, you, your voice just like went up a couple octaves there, right? Because I'm listening for the words. Yeah, right? it's, really it's like we're cognitively front loading the model, trying to figure out like, where am I supposed to be? What am I, what am I supposed to be doing? So it's like, we're not here kind of when we're doing that, but then we have to be here so we can see what's happening in front of us, the blocks, the emotions, um, and all of that super important. And so when you're kind of teaching therapists, the basics, so maybe, maybe something that might be important to talk about first and foremost is what is the point of what we're doing when couples come into our office from beginning to end the EFT, 
what is it that we are trying to accomplish on a basic level? Mm -hmm. So I would say if we keep the model really simple, couples come in because they're fighting. As simple as it, right? There's disagreement, there's tension, there's conflict. And we're going to look at simply, we call it the EFT negative cycle, but it's just what is their pattern of fight, right? Mm -hmm. And then we, what we're doing is we put the attachment frame on that. And these, these people are fighting because they're not feeling loved, they're not feeling cared for, they're feeling like they can never get it right, failing, invisible, non-existent. That's the basics. There's always going to, it's always going to funnel down to some kind of pain in this relationship around not being loved or cared for. So they, our job is to track the dynamic and weave in the attachment piece because they're, they're not in the attachment piece, your couple. They know something's wrong right? But they're not really aware of what's going on. So we weave in the attachment piece so they can begin to see the dynamic and how they protect themselves. Well, and it's the attachment piece, like you're saying, that gives everything the meaning and context, right? It's, it wouldn't be EFT without attachment because the dance that the couple is doing is attachment. And we know through attachment science, as Sue says, all behavior makes sense when made when viewed through the eyes of attachment. And that's super important on a basic level because we take a non-pathological stance, okay. which is where I see a lot of therapists get stuck. It's like they kind of want to take sides mm -hmm. and, and it's easier to have empathy and relate to somebody we see as maybe being victimized or being bullied or pushed. And, and then we can fail to kind of see the attachment dilemma happening for the other partner. And then we can, oh, this is, you know, abuse or this is that. And they don't see the system that's at work. And, you know, then they can get into like, oh, this is personality disorder or they have addiction or all these things that say, no, we shouldn't be working with them rather than saying, actually, these are all the, it's to me, it's like show and tell. We take all these pieces, it, yeah. the affairs, the addiction, you know, the behaviors, all of it, put it on, on the floor, lay it out, like, like show and tell in kindergarten for all of us to see and organize and make sense of how do these all fit together? Because clearly, because the fact that you guys are here says that you're having a hard time navigating this, you know, and some of these, so knowing, you know, like you said, how some of these things fit in are these emotional process processes like addiction, what they're turning to, to help regulate and deal with emotions. That's right. So, you know, I love what you're saying is, you know, couples come in and, and most often it's because they're fighting. Sometimes couples describe feeling disconnected and their version of disconnection isn't like this loud, hot, royal yeah. mm -hmm. fights. It's more of the way that they just kind of go in their separate corners and don't interact, you know, mm -hmm. but either way, we're looking at that system of interaction and, we want to help them solve their own problems. Right? That's right. We don't, want to, we don't want to kind of take over and get involved in the content, even though it can be hard. The, the content is real sexy sometimes. That's what George Schaller says. <laughs> it can certainly be interesting and you might want to follow that path. And we try to not do that, right? I think the when we are taking all these pieces of information and we're funneling it through our attachment lens, the one thing that again, back to the basics that people are forgetting to do is weaving in attachment longings when you are tracking cycles. Because when you're just tracking cycles, it feels, it, it can get a feeling of like hopelessness, like, oh my God, this is what we do. And oh my God, I do feel invisible. Or I feel like a failure. And then we're showing them the loop, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that we're missing is, and you want it to be different. Right. right. Or, and you wish that, and you're just longing to be seen as a yes. good person or, and you just want to be seen visible. Like we have, if we forget to weave that in, it gets, it feels like heavy and dark. I think the relationship starts to feel that way. Yes. yes. And, you know, on that note, can you kind of explain to everyone how addressing those longings in stage one is different than how it is in stage two. Cause I think that's where people get away from talking about longings. Cause we hear, Oh, that's a stage two thing. Don't go there. When mm. I think it's, it's just dealt with much differently in stage two than in stage one. Could you kind of touch on that? Well, first I'll say, if you don't deal with it in stage one, you're going to, the couple is going to feel pretty defeated. So that mm -hmm. idea of the way that I look at it is in stage one, it's about, 
we even the words I use, I'll use different words. Like I'll be like, and you want it to be different more than anything. You want it to be different, or you want more than anything to feel like a good person here, mm-hmm. or you just want to be seen. That's all you want, right? So it's like a, it's like not as mushy gushy as the attachment longing that we're going deeper into in stage two. The other thing I think in stage one, while we're doing that, we want to um, say, you know, because this person matters to you, because this person's important to you. There's a lot riding on this relationship. It's all that like mm-hmm. attachifying that we put yes. on all of our interventions, right? We keep attachifying on interventions. And I think that in when we're moving into stage two, it's it's it is really about the longing. Yeah. Right. It's really touching that longing. And even for the, the person who we're working with to touch the longing to integrate that back in so they can actually speak from that place of longing rather than I just want this to be different. Right. Or I want to be close. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I, what I think I hear you saying is in stage one, we are connecting the longing to kind of the the moves in the cycle, the longing for change, the longing to be seen differently, the longing to have closer connection versus stage two, we're going into a much deeper form of longing that's more around individual like attachment needs. Like, you know, my, my core need, my core thing that drives me is wanting to feel accepted. And can I, you know, turn to you and get that? That's much different and much deeper. And so a lot, I think that's where some of the waters get murky is it seems like we've kind of banished a lot of these things into two separate corners Mm -hmm. and, there's actually some overlap, but folks get confused as to where's the line with that overlap? How, how deep am I going with that? And is if I'm doing it deeply, that must mean I'm in stage two versus stage one. So I think this is really great way to kind of disseminate some of that. Um, so stage one, so, so kind of our stance and let's, let's talk about our stance when couples come in stage one is we don't see them as sick or pathological doesn't mean we don't address things, but we do it in the EFT way, right? With relentless empathy and curiosity so that they don't feel like, oh, this, this therapist is coming at me with judgment and condemnation. They're never going to see me as a human. So I'm going to close off and not change and not be open and dig in. So that's why we take that stance. And so our objective in stage one, you're saying, is to really identify this system, we call it the cycle, but also the attachment longings, the attachment dilemma that give all the meaning and the context to the cycle, right? It's, it's the reason for it. And if it doesn't make sense to you guys, then we haven't explored deep enough. We're probably not in the attachment frame Mm -hmm. and we want to work on the experiential level. So why is it so important for us to work on the here and now what's alive in the room? Why is that important for us? Um, I would say because we can teach people um, all about EFT and attachment and there's absolutely no change because the change is going to happen on the experiential level. So why are we stressing that we need to go into people's experience is if we want people to start to shift, like even stage one, if I'm going into therapy with you, I usually don't feel cared for. Let's just go. I don't feel, I actually don't feel cared for by you in any way. After being through X amount of EFT sessions and by me experiencing you in your sadness, loneliness, hurt, like softer emotion, and you're held there because the therapist holds you there that starts to change my experience of you. And in stage one, the first change is really, I need to start to buy in that you care about me. And you need to start to buy in basically that I care about you, or I don't think that you're all bad, right? Or I see good in you. So those shifts won't happen intellectually. There's like, I can tell my clients this stuff, but the change won't happen until they sit with it several times. Like I can sit next to my person and they have to be feeling it in the experience for me to start to shift. And that's the biggest shift in stage one. Mm-hmm. My and perception of Yeah. And what you're saying is it's not, this isn't an opinion that EFT has that, you know, oh, the best way is this way. We actually have neurological 
science to mm-hmm. back this up. We know that emotions are hardwired into the body in the same part of the brain as our basic survival needs. Attachment is survival. Whereas, you know, the logical center is not a function of that survival place. So when your attachment system detects disconnection, it fires off Mm -hmm. a signal in the brain as danger and it turns on that survival system. And neurologically, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex because the body's trying to rally all of its energy towards its survival needs. So, you know, and when couples try to say, oh, like, just think logically about it. Well, you, you weren't designed for that. Your brain literally does not function that way because your body is saying we need all of our energy and resources to go towards the survival system. So, you know, if couples could get all this stuff from just being told, I mean, they could have read it in a self-help book. They wouldn't yeah. need us, right? right? Exactly. exactly. They're in the fight at home. Guess what? That list of, of do's and don'ts and I statements goes right out the window because they're right. not in that space. Their survival system is online. And so we're really working. What you're saying is on the survival level where we're helping their nervous system to rewire itself in that open system, because that's the most powerful motivator of behavior. Right. And when you're talking to me, I can flick away and reject what you're saying. It's much harder for me to flick you away and what you're saying when I'm sitting next to you and I start to feel your sadness because it's in the room, right? Yes. It, and the longer we as the therapist can kind of expand, this is why we access and expand emotion in EFT, is that expansion helps the rewiring and helps the shifting happening. And it's much harder for me to just go, oh, you don't feel that way, right? But if we're, if we're in our headspace, I could just flick it away. It's just words, right? And then I stay in my pain and suffering. Which is what, when people, it's kind of like stage one is a, is a clash of the titans between the protections and the longings. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of people that were taught not to do emotions and how to turn away from emotions. So, you know, when you're looking at the system and like Sue says, there's only a finite set of ways that people can respond to things. So you're looking for fight, flight, or freeze behavior Mm -hmm. that's manifested out of attachment. So when one person shares their pain, sometimes you have someone turning away and when they turn away from the pain, right. And there's a reason we know an attachment that they would do that, but we also know when they turn away from the pain, they're not letting themselves be impacted when they can't be impacted, then they don't do the things that are emotionally responsive or change the system there because the very emotions are, are super important, right? We're supposed to feel bad when we hurt other people, but when we turn away from that pain and we don't let ourselves be impacted, then we're not motivated to change. Exactly. And so that's why helping everyone to feel their emotions and work on that level is, is so important. Mm -hmm. And so Debbie on a basic level. So where are we trying to get? So in terms of pursuers and withdrawers from Mm -hmm. before we go into stage two, where are we trying to get a withdrawer to? Because we know stage two starts with withdrawal re-engagement. So what, what are we working with? So I would say there's just a couple of things you're looking for with withdrawers. One is I would say, and I think this is a a mistake a lot of people make, is withdrawers have to feel their feelings live in session in stage one before you start withdrawal re-engagement. And that sounds so basic and simple, but I hear so many people say, oh, I'm doing withdrawal re-engagement. And I'm like, has the, has the withdrawer felt or access? Mo- this is the most they've ever felt. And um, then they don't feel anything, right? There's no, it's still very heady and cognitive. So the first thing I would say is withdrawers do access emotion in stage one, right? We got to get them in their body. We got to get them feeling some kind of hurt or pain or sad or what it feels like to fail. Like they don't have to label the exact emotion, but there's got to be some body sensations happening for them. Um, so that's... That- And while you say that too, it reminds me that I see a lot, again, we really stay out of pathology guys. And, and I see it kind of runs amok when I'm just like, it drives me crazy a little bit when clients come in and they're not feeling emotion, you know, we start going to, oh, they must be autistic because they can't feel emotion. Well, you know, there's a lot of attachment reasons why people don't do emotion and it has nothing to do with being autistic or being a narcissist or any of these other ugly labels. Mm -hmm. So it's, 
again, like just because a withdrawer doesn't show their emotions on the outside doesn't mean that they're empty or that they lack the capacity or the ability on the inside. They mm -hmm. just learn for survival reasons not to do it openly. That's right. And that's what we've got to get curious about and find out. So while you're saying that, I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the other thing that I think is also really important for withdrawers is the buy-in around the pursuer's behavior. If we're going to expect a withdrawer to go deeper into their experience and share pieces of view of self and their longings, which is stage two, right? They have to be able to look at that pursuer that they're in relationship with and be able to feel, not think, but feel, wow, all this fighting and all that anger that was coming at me, as crazy as it sounds, but that was you fighting for me because you really love me. Like, I got to buy into that on a deeper level, not on a head level, because someone told me that. And part of that buy-in comes from the cycle work that we're doing. We're helping each person kind of own their moves. Like a pursuer, we would be having them start to own that when I get scared, I'm going to lose you. I push, I protest. I will, I will take out my verbal acts if I have to tear your wall down because I desperately want to be on the inside with you or I'm desperately afraid to lose you, right? So really owning the attachment moves and being able to, you know, really communicate those about those a lot differently. Right. So, just, so for the withdrawer, you want them to hear, you know, that attachment, be able to take in that attachment dilemma for their partner, that this anger, their, their protesting move is about their love for me. And for the pursuer, what are we, working on helping them. So I just want to add one more piece to that. It again, I'm going back to the experiential piece because it the pursuer can say, yes, I am fighting for you because I feel like I don't matter. And I take out my verbal acts because I want to feel loved here. Again, cognitive words, the pursuer has to access the yes. like longing and the pain and the loneliness and it has to be felt in the room. So the, that's the thing that's going to shift the withdrawer is going, oh, Yes. That's how you feel, right? Because all the rest of it's just, especially pursuers are wordy. So, blah, 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 right? They'll yeah. just take it away. Um, so, so, sorry about that. I just want to add that piece. Because no, it's perfect. Experiential, right? With ba basics. Don't forget the experiential work is so important. Yes. Whatever. And, and when we're talking about these pieces, it's always experiential when clients are sharing their moves and owning their moves. You know, that step three is the primary emotions. You're in the tango and you're really grounding them in the emotions and having them feel it, access it and share it. Right. And, you know, also quickly, I kind of think that one of the, um, I guess, to know that our withdrawer is kind of de-escalated or ready for stage two, in a way, I think you're saying is they're going to be able to be a lot more present with emotion with their own and with their partner, instead of running for the hills every time, they'll be able to access internally some some bit of their emotion um, rather than just kind of banishing it away right it shouldn't be as hard honestly that's why i look at stage two shouldn't be as hard to get the withdrawer into the emotion because they've done it several times already right mm -hmm. so it's like you walk into stage two it's not like you're trying to somehow pull them it just it sort of naturally happens because they've done dipped their toe in the water several times dipped a little more stayed a little longer so by the time they get to stage two, it doesn't feel like, oh my God, this witch drawer keeps checking out, right? So yes. it's different. They're in a different place. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about pursuers, kind of where we're, how we're working with them. What does a de-escalated pursuer look like? And then I want to talk about the difference between a step three and a step five, because that hangs up a lot of people too. <laughs> but so where are we working with the pursuer in stage one? What would a de-escalated pursuer look like? So I think one of the challenges for pursuers is to own their moves, like really own it because they're so good at saying that the withdrawer is the problem. And if you would just show up emotionally for me, I wouldn't be so whatever, fill in the blank. So even though they might say, oh, yes, I get angry because I feel alone. There's a tagline there. I'm alone because you're a screw up. I'm yeah. alone. You're not emotionally present. So I feel like there's one of the change what we're looking for for pursuers is it's like a, it's like a, I own my move outside, almost like outside of you, even though we're doing systems work and we're talking about cues and triggers, right. but we have to be careful because the pursuer will take it and they'll just keep putting it on the withdrawer. So for like a blame pursuer, 
Yeah. And it's like such a gentle, secretive blame, but they're really not owning their moves. Like, it's like, I have to be able to walk into a room if I'm a pursuer, walk in the room with my spouse and say, oh my God, I just totally lashed out at you and ripped you apart and took out my verbal ax. And I was, I was just feeling lonely or sad. I did that. I did that. Not because you were on your phone or because you, so I think that's a bigger piece because withdrawers are more willing to fall on the sword. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. I screwed up. Yes, yes, yes. And pursuers are more willing to keep pointing that finger over there. It's more your fault. Yeah. If you would just show up emotionally, then I would calm down and they don't really, they have, they have a struggle seeing the impact of their move on their partner. And, and sometimes they do, and it can be kind of this double-edged sword for them where it's like a lot of pursuers keep fighting to not be seen as scary yet they can also sometimes see that they start acting scary as a way to fight <laughs> as a way to be loved as a way to have themselves be seen the way they want it to be mm-hmm. seen right so it's like i gotta act monstrous to prove that i'm not a monster it's that that right. double bind <laughs> All right. so so by the end of stage one, that pursuer is really owning their move to say, you know, yes, this is my move, but I can also take in that this doesn't work out so well for my partner, that when I take the claws out or the ax out, that this actually really hurts my partner and they're withdrawing, they're going away is part of how they protect themselves. And it's not because they don't love me. It's mm-hmm. actually because they love me right. that they're going it's, away. It's owning that I hurt my partner. Mm-hmm. My, I hurt you. I love you. And I'm the one who's, I, I hurt you. Like that's a hard thing for people. And it's more, a little harder, I think for pursuers to really be able to just own like my claws come out and I am literally cutting you up. Right. Even if I'm a soft pursuer, right. I'm a soft pursuer and my little baby claw comes out. It hurts. So I hurt the person I love. That's a hard thing for pursuers to acknowledge and sit with and like kind of own that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and, and one of the things we have to be aware of, too, is when we're going into these things, we can't expect clients to just, like, follow the script. There's going to be blocks. There's going to be exits. And we have to be prepared for those and expect and anticipate those and know that they're normal and not a sign that you're doing something wrong. <laughs> exactly right. The dangerous territory for EFT therapists when they start thinking they're doing everything wrong. Yes. Right. Yes. That's the worst thing. <laughs> So let's talk about another piece of basics. So this is a difference between step three and step five. So step three and stage one, step five and stage two. And what I find a lot of therapists kind of get hung up on is they're thinking, well, I'm going deep, so I must be in stage two. Mm -hmm. And you can you speak to that? (laughs) Sure. So in stage one, I the way I look at it is we're accessing emotion. And I think about it like almost like like it's like a more of a general um either hurt sad lonely afraid like it's general it's it's it has to be felt in the room it's linked to the cycle it's the raw spot that gets um poked when they see their person doing their x whatever the x move is that the other person's doing right and they're able to feel that emotion stay in that emotion and share that in connection to that what they do on the outside, right? The inside is the painful sadness, lonely. And so it's felt, it's labeled, um, it's shared all in stage one. Which is deep, right? That's still deep when they're accessing emotion that they've never let themselves access before. That is deep and it's going to be vulnerable, but it is a different kind of deep and vulnerable than stage two. But I don't know how people got this idea that, that, because they're going deep, it must mean stage two and it's not stage one. Like Mm -hmm. accessing and feeling emotion is deep. Exactly. Exactly. And it's a completely different feel than a conversation. Just like you and I are sitting here having a conversation. If we were in our emotion, it would feel completely different. Right. I mean, so I just, I think that in stage one, if we're not thinking we're doing emotional work, we are right. Mm -hmm. And it does feel it's vulnerable. It is vulnerable. Um, in stage two, it's like the way that I differentiate is in stage two, the goal of going deep into the emotion is around integrating like disowned parts of me, 
right? So I, so I think about view of self um, and, and view of other, which is like, I'm damaged or broken or defective, whatever messages from my usually prior attachment relationships fed me, right? Like I internalize that because that's what we do, right? If your attachment person, parent, caregiver, or primary person didn't show up for you, we internalize that there's something about me. It's safer for it to be something about me than something to be about the person who takes care of me. So that view of self and, and view of other, which is I can't trust anybody in the world, right? Because this has happened to me or everybody's, you know, I won't let anybody in. And that's that attachment history, right? I don't let them in because I've been taught from my previous attachment experiences that people won't be there for me or they'll reject me or not show up for me or, you know, right. any one of those. Right. And while you're talking, so I just kind of want to hold you in this place because it's important. Um, I know view of self and view of other does come up in stage one. And we still talk about it in stage one, but going into it in step five is much different, right? So I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Debbie, is that in stage one, when it comes up, we're kind of plugging it back to the moves in the cycle and the reactive pattern versus stage two. Now we're actually going into those deeper parts of self and we're working on healing and integrating those parts. Exactly. Exactly. So we don't ignore it in stage one. Right. We, I, I feel like we make it explicit and link it back to the cycle. Right. Yeah, so this isn't just these wounds, these vulnerable wounds around view of self don't just exist within the relationship. This is like my fundamental way of viewing myself and moving through the world and just experiencing relationship with other humans. And so we're going in and we're helping them own and access that wound that lives inside of them. And we're helping them start to own that I'm a person who deserves to be loved, that has needs and emotions. And this is what it means to be human. And it's okay to have those. Mm -hmm. And actually it can be good and healing. And we're going to start let helping them to access those and, and come to terms with those and, and really accept them in themselves and then turn and share it with their partner and ask their partner to be that safe one to show up for them to fill the tank. Right. And, and your client's partner doesn't have to have been the originator of the wound. Sometimes they are, but they don't have to be the originator of the wound in order to help heal it. Mm-hmm. Right. To be a part of the solution. Right. Mm-hmm. If this was a family of origin, wound where somebody fundamentally sees themselves as unlovable and unworthy, is that something their partner can absolutely help heal by loving them and helping them feel worthy? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. It's about, it's about, you don't need to be alone in your unlovableness and unworthiness that you've been carrying around for your whole life, right? It's you can share that dark place with me and I will just love you and be with you in that place. That's the difference. That's the thing that we're doing in stage two. Like the healing begins in that process, um, but it really is. It's like, I might walk out of EFT therapy, successful EFT therapy, still feeling parts of me are unlovable or parts of me are broken and damaged. The key is what I've learned through the process is when they get scraped by the outside world or by you, I can go into that painful place, into the dark place. And I will turn to you and reach to you to come and be with me in that space Mm -hmm. rather than attack you or come after you or shut down. That's what we're trying to do. When I bring you into the space, I let you come into that space and I let myself take in your love. That's a double pronged process, right? It's not just reaching and asking because you'll find this. I I find it really common with pursuers too, is that I may invite you in, but when you offer the love, I may block it out because I don't know how to trust it or let it in. And so Mm -hmm. we're also helping with that second part, whereas when you're offered the love, being able to take it in and being nourished by it. And that's what starts to heal the wounds is that, you know, I love what you said, getting scraped by the outside world, but I can turn to you. You're my safe place to go. And, you know, you, I share that emotion with you, that emotional space in your, 
you're my safe person. You're in my corner. You're my cheerleader, my supporter, my haven from the storm. You'll bandage me up and remind me that I'm loved and that I'm a good person. And then I, I take that in. I feel healed. I feel better. I can brush myself off and get back on the horse again. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and even if I'm scraped by you, right? If I take in your love for me and enough experiences, then even when I get scraped by you, I might not in that moment be able to turn to you, but what we're trying experientially, we want our clients to feel safe enough to do that. So, okay, I got scraped by you. And later that day or the next day, I turn to you with my heart open and I share that pain to, for you to come in and comfort me. Right. So, I mean, it doesn't like rock the foundation. Right. Right. And I think that's why our research shows more success in our follow up is because once people learn to reach to that other person vulnerably and they get that comfort, it feels good. So they continue to do that. That's a that feels a lot better than being caught in negative cycles. Yes. Right? So. And it's stage two that becomes the glue. A lot of folks don't do a complete stage two and their couples may leave therapy and then they can kind of backslide or re-escalate because we didn't formally, uh, you know, put all the adhesive down, which is teaching them how to bond. So stage one, it's called cycle de-escalation, right? This centers more around the process because we are process consultants that keeps a couple stuck, not being able to solve their own problems. And we're looking at how it functions what it does, the emotions involved, and we're helping them really live and breathe it and interrupt it on the the emotionally experiential level. But Mm -hmm. the absence of conflict does not necessarily mean the presence of bonding. And we want to help people have amazing relationships. And if we've agreed to, you know, sign on for this till death do us part thing, why not have it be the most amazing relationship you've ever had? We don't Mm -hmm. want to have a couple just, you know, live parallel to each other and mutually check out during Netflix. We want to teach them how to actually bond with each other, how to share their humanity with one another, the parts that they don't share with anyone else, and how to be loved and love their partner in a deeper way so that they can experience the abundance of love and joy that comes from being in a partnership and not just have it be, uh, that's my marriage, right? Exactly. And also, also knowing that amazing relationships, there's hurt there too. Mm -hmm. We'll step on each other's toes and you'll hurt each other. And once people go through EFT and go through bonding events, those are opportunities for couples to mm-hmm. strengthen the glue. As you said, that's the part of the foundation, right? You're going to hurt. You're going to hurt. Cycles are going to come up, right? They're, they're, someone might scratch, scratch into your view of self here and there. And you're, you're going to take that as an opportunity for closeness, right? To get that good feeling again, right? Yeah. Or you're not. And if you don't, then. Right. There's more. When, and I love, you know, when couples don't have a securely attached bond, there's less tolerance for the gray area. And let's face it, most of life exists in the gray area. Not everything is black and white, but Mm -hmm. in insecure attachment, couples really want to force things into that black and white. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in stage two, we're restructuring that bond, you know, when they're successfully able to restructure it, they have more tolerance for that gray area. So it's okay to disagree. And disagreement doesn't necessarily cause disconnection. If they have disconnection, they're able to turn towards each other and fix it themselves and not get stuck there, right? They have the tools. um, And they're able, again, to, and this is something that I tell all my couples when they come in, No couples therapist can stop you from fighting, right? Whether or not a couple fights is not a predictor of health in a relationship. I know lots of people seem to think, oh, you're going to stop us from fighting. And that's not realistic because that's a normal part of relationships. It's how you fight. It's being able to repair. That makes the difference. It's not, let's do everything we can to never fight again. And and we're only going to be healthy if we don't fight. I have couples that don't fight and they aren't connected. Right, they're, <laughs> they're, not, they're not that healthy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody loves fighting, but right. I think 
aim for pursuers, we're more comfortable with conflict because we see it as necessary to reach to new levels with each other, to really break through, I say to work out the kinks in a relationship and help it get smooth. But when couples um, get stuck there and they don't have a lot of success, then they start to lose hope and confidence in their ability to get through a fight. And then the fights don't seem like they have a function because they're not actually accomplishing anything. They're not growing together. They're not resolving anything. And when couples don't know how to bond, they are going to backslide. Like that was one of the biggest mistakes I made in EFT was not really recognizing the importance of, of full stage two, not really understanding how to do it well. And my couples would kind of graduate and then they come back like a year later when I was like way better and certified. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I, I, I seem like the mess ups in my own work, you know, but I can see how they backslid because I didn't, teach them how to bond. And it's that bonding that helps them build that positivity. And <clears throat> they have enough successes that when they have some conflict, it doesn't, it's not like a wrecking ball through their marriage. It doesn't become this, this valley of death, emotional death in their relationship. Right. right. They learn to reach to each other, right? Mm-hmm. Opportunities for more closeness. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So So EFT stage one, we are helping couples de-escalate their cycle, the system in place. Remember guys, we are process consultants. We are always after the process. What keeps them from being able to solve their own problems? Because that's what we want is couples to solve their own problems. We don't pathologize. And what I love about EFT is there's really not a problem that EFT cannot work on right? Mm -hmm. There may be different protocols for different types of presenting issues. Like if there is domestic violence or active addiction, doesn't mean we can't do great couples work. In fact, the attachment work can be really vital to helping those things shift. Mm -hmm. Now it's important to attend your master classes and learn how to work with these so that you know how to put them into the cycle and you don't lead them into vulnerability before they're ready. You certainly won't. If there's active DV, you're not going to be taking them into stage two or asking them to be vulnerable, but addiction, personality disorders, you know, there is not anything that EFT can't handle. Mm -hmm. And really knowing the attachment lens helps us be with both people because we have to build an alliance with both people in the room. And to understand that these are two humans who, I love what you said, who are just trying to love and be loved and be understood and feel like they matter. Mm -hmm. You know, Sue's famous question is, are you there for me? Do I exist in the mind of the person I love Mm -hmm. when we're not uh, together physically occupying the same space? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't get caught taking sides, right? Even when it feels easier to relate to one person or the other. So like sex discrepancies and desire, right? It's easier. Oh, you know, this come has come up a lot. Oh, one person is pushing the other person for sex. That's manipulation or that's mm-hmm. abuse. But wait, hello, it's a system, right? What about the person? We know that healthy connected couples also want to have sex and enjoy sex. So if one partner is shutting it down, And we're expecting the other person to be okay with sex, not being a part of their bonding and their marriage. Well, that sucks. Mm -hmm. There's something there too, right? There, there is two sides to every story. And our task is to see both and make sense and bring them together and see, okay, this is the dance that you guys do right now that gets you stuck. Let's see how we can get you unstuck. And now stage two, we're going to teach you how to dance together in the way that you guys want to be dancing. And we're going to teach you your own steps of attachment so that you can make up your own steps when you're at home and dance the love dance. I know. Dance the love dance. Dance the love dance. I'm such a nerd right there. Right. What is EFT not? What are, what are some things that we don't do in EFT or kind of misconceptions that you find that therapists have that maybe we should get clear on? Um, I think a common misconception is you always work with the work with the withdrawer first. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think it's because we do withdraw re-engagement first that people walk away thinking that you're supposed to do that. So people are dismissing pursuers in stage one. 
um, and saying, thank you, saying, oh, I have to work with my withdrawer. So that is like a, mm -mm. we have to remember we're working evenly in stage one with both members of the couple. If we're frustrated with one member of the couple, it means we've lost our attachment frame, not that that person is the problem. And so it's just information for us. So go back, try to see your client through the attachment frame so you can then track the way they're impacting each other. Right. So, so beautiful. I love that, Debbie. I love that. If you've lost your way, you've, you've lost the attachment frame and that relentless empathy. I wrote a book on this, guys, if you haven't checked out on Amazon and Sue Johnson endorsed it. And it's all about how to keep that empathy. And it's seeing our clients through that attachment frame that allows us to stay in that window of empathy. And so I love I love what you're saying. And I guess we forgot to mention why we work with the withdrawal first in stage two. I love what you're saying. Doesn't mean stage one. This is stage two. There is a particular reason. And would you like to share what that reason is in stage two? Sure. Well, what I would like to ask people to do is put yourself in the shoes of a pursuer and withdrawer and imagine if you're in stage two, if you are a pursuer, are you jumping off the cliff before your withdrawer does? The answer is going to be no way. So why do withdrawers go first? They go first because there's no way you're getting that pursuer to jump off that cliff into their view of self, into the darkest places where they've been left and abandoned. And they try jumping off the cliff 25,000 times or a year in their life, right? And they keep getting hurt. So they're not doing it. So you're going to hit roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. If once the couple is de-escalated, you don't get that withdrawer to own their own attachment longings, needs, come forward with it, share their view of self, be vulnerable. They got to do it first. And then that gives the pursuer courage to then yeah. do it. It's like what I kind of think of it as when we have each person identify their attachment needs and turn and ask their partner to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. If the other partner is not emotionally engaged and online, it's like, leaping off a trapeze and having no net underneath you. You have to have something to catch you. And pursuers are usually a lot already a lot more comfortable with knowing their emotions, accepting that they have emotions. They're, they're not usually the type some, sometimes they are, but um, they're not usually the type to dismiss or disown the fact that they have needs. Usually they're the ones fighting, even if they have to use the claws to get their needs met. So if a withdrawer can't even admit that they have their own needs and emotions and that those are normal and valid and reasonable, guess what? When that pursuer turns to share, they're going to be dismissing their partner's needs. Like you're just being too needy. You need to need me less. And that's going to create a huge rupture. And, and that's already what's been happening for that partner. So that's why in stage two, particularly what you're saying, Debbie, is why we need to have the withdrawer go first is we need to have them online to build that safety net so that when it comes time for the pursuers turn, that withdrawer is not dismissing because if they're disowning their own needs, they're disowning their partner's needs. Mm -hmm. And so we can't complete the stage safely if we can't get the, it's kind of like the, I don't want to say the slowest link, but we have to have both people kind of up to that same level before we have them then take the next step to dive in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. is there anything else that's really important that you feel like our folks need to know about EFT on a basic level or what they can do to, I, I'm a big fan of folks touching up on attachment history because for some reason our schools did a very terrible job teaching us about attachment. They just taught us it was about bonding. They didn't teach us that actually behavior, mm -hmm. um, behavioral change and emotion regulation are actually part of it. Right. Um, what, what would you I, suggest? Or? Um, I think I would encourage people, this is going to sound like a silly thing to do, but because I'm my kick these days in teaching is all about the experiential stuff. I encourage people when you're taping your sessions to turn off the volume and don't listen to the clients, look and what you see and imagine you can only say interventions based on what you're seeing with no volume, which means you got no words. So what do you learn from your couple? We did this in core skills. I, I had um, 
a couple of people who were willing to turn off the volume and type in the chat box what they were seeing about the couple. And it was fascinating. And it, they were, it was actually, we were, we were all on the same page, seeing the same thing, but it's really training yourself really to not listen to all the content, but training yourself to catch the process, comment experientially, and stay in with what's happening right in front of you. If you have words of stories of what happened last week, yeah. you're, you're, you're making it harder for yourself when you start following that story of the fight from last week. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's brilliant. I'm going to try that because you're watching it and you're like, you know, I, I see these hand gestures. What, what emotion is my client conveying? You can see is one person turning away, one person is turning towards, you know, that's the basic attachment dance is that balance between closeness seeking and distance seeking. So you got one who's seeking distance and they're putting their hands up or the pursuer is like, ah. <laughs> exactly. That's Even if you just watch fun. five or 10 minutes of your yeah. session that way to just start training yourself. I think we need to train ourselves. I talk about training your clients to be good EFT clients. Mm -hmm. We need to train ourselves to be good EFT therapists, which is training the brain to pick up different things than we normally would as therapists, right? Yes. It's not about thank the story. You. And yeah. what I love, so that's brilliant. And I'm going to start doing that, man. Thank you. That is a wonderful tidbit. That's just going to change my life. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, to you guys, when you're watching your tapes and you see a client who you're not seeing anything from, right? Recognize that that's not an absence of signals. It's a signal, Right. If, if the world is falling down around them and they're just playing cool as a cucumber, that's a survival strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So don't assume that just because you don't see emoting that nothing is happening. That is, they're never not doing nothing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're doing something, even if the, the reactive part is kept on the inside, that's still the fact that your partner could be screaming and yelling and you're just kind of stuck in place is a sign of something, right? right? So, and two on, on the same lines and remember EFT is integrative and holistic. So we, we have parts of other experimental models already built in and a great refresher. I always suggest go back on YouTube. You can watch it. Remember the Fritz Perls tapes of him working. I think with Kathy is her name, whatever her name was. Never once does Fritz say, why are you here? What's your problem? All he does is read her body movements right. and it's just a brilliant refresher to like when I'm sitting here in session to pay attention to like, Oh, that client like did a fist or I saw them tighten their hands or their eyes looked that way, or they took a deep breath or, you know, it helps you hone in and pay attention to these things that we can easily miss. And our clients also miss sometimes and start to notice, Hey, something's happening. Right. Give yourself, give yourself permission to not listen to the words. Give yourself permission to not hold 20 EFT balls in the air as you're trying to juggle them all. Give yourself permission to go into your sessions with a tiny goal. I call them EFT mini goals. Like maybe you're just going to be experiential today and only comment on body language or nonverbals. Maybe you just play with that for a session, right? And don't try to hold this entire model and figure it out and try to do the tango and the steps and the alliance and like, and who's your pursuer and who's your mature? How are you even emotionally present and picking up cues when you're in your head so much? Yeah, so it's, it's going to be harder to tell when, when you're in your head and not in the present process. So, well, thank you so much, Debbie. This was brilliant. So how do folks find you? You know, if they want to take a training with you, they want to book a training with you. What do you right. have going? So um, my website is CouplesTherapyNJ.com. Um, I have several, I have a whole training series on my uh, website. I call them EFT boosters. I started them when COVID happened because I felt like people needed boosts in their EFT training. Um, so there's all different topics there. Um, and it really kind of honing in on the skills and basically breaking down the model to little pieces. So that's on my website. Of course, externship and core skills. You can always find that information either at the ISF website or that's on my website as well. Um, but I, I mean, I just am a really big proponent of EFT and helping people break down the model, keep it simple, take small pieces into your session, hold that attachment frame and you'll get it. Like you'll figure this out. It's when we have too much in our head 
that it's that we feel like we, we can't do this and everybody can do it. It's just a matter of give yourself permission to be present with your clients. Absolutely. And you have an affair, you have a workshop or a series on affairs, right? I do. That's also on my website. Yep. I have a, it's like a three session affairs series training. That's also available on my website, couplestherapynj.com. And that's N is a Nancy J because it stands for New Jersey guys. So yeah. if you're listening to this in podcast form, then it's couples therapy, NJ, New Jersey.com. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to um, paste a link, copy a link to Debbie's website on the description for the video. So you can just hit the drop down and click right to it and go right to her site. And um, they can contact you through your site as well. If they want to book you for training. That's right. They certainly can. Absolutely. <laughs> Guys, if you're watching this in any part of the United States, any part of the world, contact Debbie. If you want her to come to your area to do a training, she's got so many different topics or she can talk to you about the basics. Again, you want to book her for an externship, whatever, just shoot her an email. And uh, I'm sure she'd be glad to hear from you guys. So thank you again, Debbie, so much for being with us. We so appreciate your time and your wisdom. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much to our viewers. Thank you for watching the videos and making them successful. Make sure you check out my book on Amazon, Relentless Empathy in the Therapeutic Relationship, Connecting with Challenging and Difficult Clients. It is an EFT book, and it was written for people who don't like to read <laughs> a whole lot and don't have a lot of time. So, but uh, it's, it's a pretty awesome book. So make sure you guys look that up on Amazon and make sure that you hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Don't forget to buy my book, Using Relentless Empathy in the Therapeutic Relationship, Connecting with Challenging and Resistant Clients, for helping professionals, available on Amazon or on my website, www.drbugatti.com.